Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the Weird Al movie UHF. Dave's obsession! Dave's obsession of the moment! Now, in a just world, we wouldn't be saying the Weird Al movie. In a just world, this would simply be the first of many Weird Al movies. Look, we only barely got out of a cartoon supervillain presidency. We clearly do not live in a just world. I'm assuming most of my audience has seen UHF by now, but in case you haven't, here's a brief refresher. Weird Al Yankovic plays George Newman, a daydreaming underachiever who can't hold down a job and constantly tests the patience of his roommate Bob, his girlfriend Terry, and his uncle Harvey. But when Harvey wins a doomed UHF TV station in a poker game, George's aunt suggests he run it. Despite George's best efforts to be a good boss, hosting several shows himself, promoting the frustrated receptionist Pamela to news, and hiring Stanley Spadowski, a janitor who was unfairly fired by the evil R.J. Fletcher of Channel 8, the station keeps losing money. On top of that, George's desperate attempts to dig his way out of the hole cause him to lose Terry. At the height of his depression, George walks off the set of the kids' show and lets Stanley host, and surprisingly, Stanley's unique energy draws an audience for the first time in the station's history. George becomes inspired to give shows to more of his oddball friends and neighbors, and the quirky little station fueled by the community becomes the number one station in town. Fletcher seeks revenge by placing an offer to buy the station from Harvey for the price of his massive gambling debts, so George and his friends have to raise the money to buy the station first. That's the plot, but nobody watches this movie for the plot. They watch it because it's the Weird Al movie, along with everything that entails. In the 80s, Al Star was rising, and it was only natural that someone would want to cash in on his popularity by giving him a movie. So he and his manager Jay Levy wrote the script together, shopped it around, and eventually Orion Pictures greenlit the film with Jay attached to direct. I play a character named George Newman who's kind of a daydreamer. He's like Walter Mitty in a way. You know, James Thurber said that Walter Mitty was partially based on Robert Benchley, who actually went on to play the role in a radio production of the short story before the Danny Kaye movie was even made. So, Weird Al's the modern Robert Benchley. Really putting the Al in Al Gonquin Roundtable. Disney, remake the reluctant dragon with Weird Al, you cowards! The supporting cast has a few veterans, such as legendary character actor Kevin McCarthy as R.J. Fletcher, who's almost as evil as Congressman Kevin McCarthy, but the ensemble was largely people who weren't very well known at the time, or at least not known for comedy. Some of them have gone on to have megastar careers, and only a few of them have gone on to be completely unhinged. Almost as fascinating as the actual ensemble were the numerous other people who were almost cast in the film. But if I dwell on that now, we'll never get to any of the other good stuff. Note to self, D-list on the miscasting opportunities of UHF. But more than anything else, the movie is intended as a vehicle for jokes, gags, and sketches. And yeah, it's an 80s comedy, which means that not every element has aged great. Although fortunately, the most egregious jokes were deleted. But there's still a lot about this movie that was ahead of its time. We already know every 80s villain was based on Trump, but only this movie had the foresight to also have Don Jr. Why no, I did not expect this to become my most political video when I started writing it. Why do you ask? Perhaps unexpected for the Weird Al movie, there's only a few songs in the film and only one song parody, which is really more of a song mashup. But they make up for the shortage with a bunch of music video parodies in the title song's music video. Only way Al would get to do a Prince parody, I guess. Oh, and Al later gave us a second song parody in the DVD commentary. Orion, Orion is bankrupt now. But what's most remarkable to me about this movie is that despite being the Weird Al movie, it doesn't really feel like just a Weird Al vanity project. Like, yes, Weird Al is definitely the main auteur, it's definitely his creative voice throughout, you'd never mistake it for just some random studio comedy, but it's so easy to picture, like, the Polly Shore version of this, where the comedian the film is built around is the weird, wacky, funny one, and everyone else in the movie is a boring old straight man. That's not what this movie is. This isn't just, hey, look how funny this Weird Al guy is, let's watch his wacky shenanigans. This is a movie that lets the whole world be weird and lets the ensemble shine. Sure, Al takes the spotlight in a few sequences, but he also spends several scenes being the straight man. He doesn't always have to be the weird one. Nothing like he was portrayed in that fake biopic. I'm the weird one. I'm the weird one! Because UHF is not just an ego trip for Al, it's a celebration of the kind of weirdness Al loves. Just like how in the movie, U62 is a celebration of the community. The station's actual saving grace starts when Al's character recognizes someone else is a better fit for a job than he is. Weird Al is so humble that he didn't insist on Weird Al being the saving grace of the Weird Al movie. I think it's sweet how Al took this film opportunity, this instance of a studio taking a chance on that funny Weird Al kid, and 
turned it into a story about George taking a chance on Pamela and Stanley and all the other funny weirdos in his community. It feels like paying it forward, even though it's paying it forward to fictional characters, but the movie production still feels like U62. A whole bunch of scrappy kids putting on a show, getting a chance to showcase their talent. Oh, this is the grape catching scene. All right, uh, Mr. Deal. Thanks, David Bowen and I were kind of oh. hanging around by the craft services table and I was throwing grapes at him and he was catching them in his mouth. And it was a, a talent he's had for a long time. And a couple of minutes before we actually shot the scene, we decided to, to do this. I think we did two takes and he caught every single grape. The upside down yodeler, uh, his name was Charles Marsh. He used to stand on his head and play guitar at the Turner Turnpike toll gate. He had a talent show to get some of these people. That's right, we had a gong show. That was one of the very first things we did when we uh, went to Tulsa. And much like U62, the film UHF was up against a lot of competition from the big studios. Turns out the summer of 1989 would be one of the biggest blockbuster summers imaginable. Unfortunately, in real life, that summer the big studios won. The movie severely underperformed and, well... Ryan is bankrupt now. And then to add insult to injury, one of the films that crushed it at the box office later had a sequel which ripped UHF off. This community means about as much to me as a festering bowl of dog snot. You gotta admit, I played this stinking city like a harp from hell. Well, ripped off UHF, ripping off a face in the crowd, but still, low blow, Burton. Audiences barely turned up to see the film in theaters and critics savaged it. Roger Ebert from the Chicago Sun-Times calls it a depressing slog through recycled comic formulas. Those who laugh at UHF should inspire our admiration. In these dreary times, we must treasure the easily amused. Well, gee, thanks, Roger. What, did I run over your dog or something? Oh, don't worry. Al later had his revenge. Yeah, well, that's the kind of ignorance I'd expect from a duty head like you. You talking to me, poopy pants? Snot face. Vomit nose. Hooty fish. Hooty fish. Thing is, as much as I love this movie, yeah, I can understand why it had trouble finding an audience. Mostly because there was so much competition, but also because the movie is weird. And I can't pretend it doesn't have its shortcomings. Neither Al nor Jay had any real screenwriting experience, and it kind of shows. I didn't really have an artistic vision. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, to be funny and, and to make sure that we captured the comedy uh, correctly on, uh, on the screen. You know, in fact, the studio would, uh, would often say to me, you know, where's a style? We're looking to develop a style maybe in this. And uh, I just didn't see it that way. To me, this was more in the vein of, you know, Kentucky Fried Movie or Airplane or basically where it's all about the gags. And as long as the comedy's playing, that's what it's about. So if it's funny, that's good. And if it's not, redo it. Um, and that was kind of my point of view. Why didn't you tell me you didn't know what you were doing? The plot is treated as little more than a linking device to get from sketch to sketch, but there's too much plot for it to really get away with that. That said, while the plot's nothing groundbreaking, I really think from a structure perspective, there's only one scene that actually needs to be fixed. There's something I can do to help? Not unless you've got $75,000. No, sorry. This is ridiculous. There must be something I could do. The U-62 telephone is on the air! So George just gets the idea, unmotivated by anything in particular. It's not unrealistic necessarily, but it's unsatisfying based on general audience expectations of cause and effect in a movie. And it only would have taken one quick rewrite to fix. There's something I can do to help. Not unless you've got $75,000. Uh, I have one dollar. Great. Now we just need to find 75,000 more people like you. Here's the thing, though. I think this movie is better because it's imperfect. A movie about celebrating the scrappy underdogs and all the weird things they bring to the table would feel inauthentic if it was a polished, shiny, neat package with a ton of money and experienced talent behind it. Instead, this movie, despite being built around spoofs and sketches and irony, still manages to overflow with earnestness and sincerity. And as much as there are certainly things I would rewrite if I were doing this project, and I'm sure there are even more things Al and Jay would rewrite, 
I think the flaws in this movie only make it feel more true to its own spirit. I mean, sure, let's lose the part where George gets real stalkery with his ex, or at least make that a more blatant satire of problematic rom-com tropes, but overall, this movie's shortcomings remind you that this story about scrappy underdogs is a scrappy underdog itself. And much like U62 didn't deserve to be demolished by Channel 8, UHF didn't deserve to be crushed by the big blockbusters. Fortunately in real life, there aren't only three acts, and the box office failure wasn't the end of this movie's story. The movie became a cult classic on VHS very quickly, and the cult was only fueled when the VHS went out of print. So much so that when MGM acquired Orion and started releasing their catalog on DVD, they worked closely with Al to turn the UHF DVD into an event jam-packed with bonus features hosted by the man himself. Yes, I look a little different than I do in UHF because I shot that movie 13 years ago. Okay, but you shot this featurette 19 years ago and you still look the same, so that excuse doesn't fly, Al. In addition to the movie, a behind-the-scenes featurette from the archive, and the music video, the DVD includes Al making fun of an abridged collection of deleted scenes and a very informative audio commentary that somehow manages to include visual gags. Look out! They're coming through the window! They're coming through the window! See? Told ya. And aside from finally giving many of Al's fans a chance to see his major motion picture, this DVD can also boast another accomplishment. One of the very few times interactive menus is actually a legitimate bonus feature as new footage of Al was shot just for the menus, and it really adds to the fun. The one downside of the DVD is it's one of those stupid double-sided DVDs with the widescreen version on one side and the Panascan version on the other, and I hate this. I don't like having to handle the DVD so carefully just because someone decided the top should also be the bottom. The only plus side of this particular flaw is at least Al got to have some fun with it on the aforementioned menus. Hi. Um, that feature's on the other side. You gotta turn the disc over. Thanks. Hey, if you want to see that, you gotta turn the DVD over. Like it says, that feature is on the other side! Well, despite that shortcoming, when the DVD was released in 2002, it was one of the top 10 selling DVDs of the week. UHF was finally a Hollywood success. Then in 2014, Shout Factory released the 25th anniversary Blu-ray on a single-sided disc, thank you very much. The Blu-ray includes Al's 2014 Comic-Con panel with Joan Ray, and it retains most of the bonus features from the DVD, but it doesn't have those fun menus anymore, or the visual gags in the audio commentary. Just another step in UHF's long journey of greatness linked to imperfection. Yeah, well, I'm just glad this movie is available in so many ways now because I love it. I've loved it from the first time I saw it. In fact, let me tell you about when I first saw this movie. My childhood best friend had told me about this really funny movie with Weird Al and this hilarious Indiana Jones scene and Kramer yelling about mops and all this wacky stuff, and it sounded funny and I liked the Weird Al songs I had heard at that point, so eventually my friend loaned me the DVD. This happened on kind of a busy day, so I couldn't watch the DVD all in one sitting, but every time I had to pause it and go do something else, I was just counting down the hours until I could resume the movie. And yeah, of course the movie was funny. I laughed myself silly at Conan the Librarian and Raoul teaching poodles how to fly, but my excitement to keep watching the film wasn't just because it was making me giggle, because despite the movie's general disregard for plot, I gotta say, the first time I watched it, I was really emotionally invested. I don't know, maybe I just really identified with a guy who kind of slacks off at assigned work, possibly due to undiagnosed attention issues, while feeling like his creativity is unappreciated, even though, let's face it, most of what he does is just rip on existing pop culture. But as soon as he gets a chance, he jumps at the opportunity to make silly stuff with his friends for all the world to see, and he'll do anything to fight to keep that chance going. Kind of hit close to home, all that. So when I finally got to finish the movie late at night, and when this happened... Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> now wait just one minute, what do you think you're doing? We did it, the station's gone! Yeah! I had actual tears in my eyes. The Weird Al movie made me cry. Tears of joy, but still, Weird Al made me cry. Lots of people are fans of this movie because they're already fans of Weird Al. For me, it was the other way around. This movie is what turned me from an appreciator of the couple of Weird Al songs I had heard into an obsessed Weird Al fanboy. 
This movie is the cause of my fandom. Because I no longer saw Weird Al as just a guy who did some funny songs, I saw myself in him and his work. This silly film that moved me so much drove me to listen to all his songs, seek out all his TV appearances, see him live every chance I got, and rebuy all his music I already owned just because it came in a fancy accordion case. Well, and because all my CDs have been stolen out of my car, but I would have bought this again anyway. This movie turned me into a Weird Al fan, and I've never looked back. But enough about me. When did you first see UHF? And when did you first fall in love with the works of Weird Al? Let's discuss this all in the comments, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off. Special thanks to my patrons, not only for their continued financial support, but also for watching me film this episode on a live stream. You can support at patreon.com slash doggins for access to the Patreon exclusive live streams, as well as hours upon hours of additional bonus features, including an exclusive podcast I do with my wife. If you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend episode 32 of the podcast, where we talk about all the times we met Weird Al.